Welcome to the first IVF Worldwide Online Congress in Reproductive Medicine. In this video, we would like to introduce you to our virtual congress platform. All doors, screens, and signs can be clicked to navigate to the desired congress area. To view the program click on this screen. On April 25th, top names in the field will be presenting via a live broadcast and answering your questions. The lectures can be accessed through the lecture hall. All lectures will be recorded and made available after the live event, for those of you who are not able to attend the live sessions. Please note that in order to receive CME points, you need to attend the live broadcast. To access the exhibition area, please click on this door. The exhibition will open one month prior to the meeting. You can access any booth by clicking on it. On April 25th, a live chat option will be available to interact with exhibitors in real time. If you have any issues, or have questions, visit us at the info desk. You are welcome to send us an email at any time to info at cme-congresses.com. We hope to see you all on April 25th at 11 a.m. Central European time. In the meantime, we wish you all good health during these challenging times. To the first IVF Worldwide Online Congress in Reproductive Medicine. In this video, we would like to introduce you to our virtual congress platform. All doors, screens, and signs can be clicked to navigate to the desired congress area. To view the program click on this screen. On April 25th, top names in the field will be presenting via a live broadcast and answering your questions. The lectures can be accessed through the lecture hall. All lectures will be recorded and made available after the live event, for those of you who are not able to attend the live sessions. Please note that in order to receive CME points, you need to attend the live broadcast. To access the exhibition area, please click on this door. The exhibition will open one month prior to the meeting. You can access any booth by clicking on it. On April 25th, a live chat option will be available to interact with exhibitors in real time. If you have any issues, or have questions, visit us at the info desk. You are welcome to send us an email at any time to info at cme-congresses.com. We hope to see you all on April 25th at 11 a.m. Central European Time. In the meantime, we wish you all good health during these challenging times.
Hello to everyone. In these difficult times, we at IVF Worldwide would like to acknowledge our colleagues, physicians, nurses, and medical professionals working in hospitals all over the world as they are the frontline figures against this global threat and deserve all our support and gratitude. Now more than ever, we understand that advancing medical education cannot wait. We need to keep healthcare professionals well informed as to the latest medical development. We at IVF Worldwide <clears throat> will continue doing everything we can to bring unbiased research based content to our colleagues. We have the pleasure and honor to host today Professor Jacques Donez from Belgium. Professor Jacques Donez is very well known as a key opinion leader in the field of reproductive medicine. He has focused his research activities on three main topics, tubal infertility, endometriosis, and finally, ovarian cryopreservation and transplantation. He published over 700 original articles in peer-reviewed journals. Since 2012, he is Professor Remitus at the Catholic University of Louvain and Director of the Society of Research and Infertility in Brussels. He was the President of the European Societies of Gynecology and Endocrinology, the World Endometriosis Society, the International Society of Gynecology and Endoscopy, and the International Society for Fertility Preservation. His topic for the lecture tonight is very timely, followed the presentation of Professor Pellicer a few days ago, and it is ovarian endometrioma related infertility, IVF or surgical first, a dilemma for the gynecologist. Professor Donez, please. Thank you, uh, Professor Salam. I would like to make uh, some introduction before my lecture to my colleagues from over the world. COVID-19 is everywhere, in our life of every day. The COVID-19 has definitively changed our life. In many countries, people are confined. In many countries, the situation is dramatic. Allow me to have a special thoughts to my Italian friends and all Italian people face to a dramatic situation. And we heard from Pellicer, Antonio Pellicer, a few days ago, this situation. In all countries, people died, but we have to continue the battle against the virus. Moreover, we have to continue to live. We have to continue to communicate, to maintain not only the body, but also the brain in good condition, to be ready to restart a normal life after we have won the war, after we have won the battle. Thanks to the technology, we are together, even we are confined and uh, thanks to the organizer, we are able to communicate and to continue to have such a social life. Let me start with uh, my lecture on ovarian endometrioma related infertility surgery of IVF first. It's a dilemma for the gynecologist and it's a battle I have very frequently with my good friend, Edgardo Somigliana. And in fact, if you look at this slide, the debate is not new. Imagine it is a slide from more than 10 years from Somigliana. There is a balance between surgery and expectant management in case of endometrioma. But this debate even it's very old, remain a very hot topic. Not only in Europe, in the United States, but look a paper from New Zealand. 
surgery of in vitro fertilization? The simplicity of this question believes its complexity. And as an answer, he a right to reply to an editorial. When all of you have a, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a knife. And finally, I organized a fertile battle, well known series in fertility, sterility, and the title of the fertile battle was Women with Endometrium Related Infertility Face the Dilemma when choosing the appropriate therapy, surgery, or in vitro fertilization. And I've invited several people, and we wrote this article. What are the arguments in favor of IVF? What are the arguments in favor of surgery as primary approach? Pro-surgery, on the left side, Bruce Lessig, with the title, The Elephant in the Room is not the endometrioma, but, question mark, Stefan Gortz, and Olivier Donnet. And the argument could be summarized in this uh, cartoon, which was published in Fertility and Sterility. And the argument of the surgeon, I will say, are uh, the risk of IVF prior to surgery. Progression of the disease, Increase in inflammatory uh, reaction and oxidative stress, difficult to oversight retrieval, risk of cycle cancellation, follicular fluid contamination, endometrioma infection, undiagnosed ocular malignancy, risk of rupture, and chemical peritonitis, and pregnancy related complications. Of course, all these complications are not frequent, but they exist. That was the argument of the surgeon. And on the other part, three gynecologists, well-known gynecologists, are in favor of IVF as first approach. Edgar Gosomigliana, Charles Chapron, and Juan Garcia Velasco. And the argument ah, the risk of endometrioma surgery prior, prior to IVF are result depends on a surgeon's skill, the cost, the possible surgical complication. The most important is impact to ovarian reserve and risk of premature ovarian failure. Incomplete surgery and recurrence, and of course, surgery immediately assisted reproductive technology. So that, where are we going? Let me start a little bit about the pathogenesis of an ovarian endometriosis. In fact, in our opinion, and it was published already a long time ago, the endometrioma is the consequence of the metaplasia after in, of metaplasia of a mesothelium after invagination. And this endometrioma, while growing, pushed back all the follicles far away from the endometrioma. With as a consequence here on this MRI, you can see here a big cyst, and the closet demonstrate that in fact, 95% of the endometrioma content is just chocolate fluid. And importantly, you see the healthy ovarian tissue 
surrounding, is surrounding the endometrioma, and the white spots represent all the small antral follicles. As a consequence, if you do a biopsy here of the so-called healthy tissue, you will observe just the chocolate fluid, the endometrial epithelium and stomach, which is very thin, the fibrosis and the oversight. Closer. You see here the endometrioma capsula. The endometriotic tissue, the endometrial ectopic tissue is only this very thin area with uh, some epithelium and stroma. And the fibrosis here, which is called the capsula, is in fact a pseudo capsula. It's not like a dermoid cyst. In fact, if you look here, there is no plane of cleavage between the healthy tissue with all the oversight and the fibrotic tissue, the pseudocapsula. And it's easy to imagine that when you stretch the capsula, the pseudocapsula, as there is no plane of cleavage, the risk to remove together the ovarian tissue and the oversight is very, very important. So then the real question is, do we need to treat by surgery endometrioma before IVF? If IVF is indicated of in any condition of infertility. We can have a look on the literature. There are many, many papers, and we have no time to go into detail, but I would like to stress a little bit on this very nice review published in Human Reproduction Update by Hamdan Dusselman and uh, Lee and Chung. And uh, I would like that you read with me here the sentence. Women with endometrioma undergoing IVF ICSI at similar reproduction outcomes when compared with those without the disease. But look, although the cancellation rate is significantly higher. I made some editorial on the paper, and in fact, the data on the impact of endometrios on IVF results are controversial. This systematic review and meta-analysis by Amdan conclude that women with more severe endometriosis, stage 3 and 4, are poorer reproductive outcome. But they also found a similar clinical pregnancy rate, live birth rate, miscarriage rate in women with and without intact endometrioma. What does it mean? In fact, we have to pay attention that the cancellation rate is three times higher in women with endometrioma as published in the meta-analysis and review of Amdan. Moreover, fewer mature oversight were retrieved. It could have repercussion by reducing the number of embryos potentially available for frozen embryo transfer and the cumulative live rate. In a review by Sanchez, it was already known that the number of M2 oversight would decrease in case of presence of endometrioma because there is lower oversight yield to the presence of the cyst. And she mentioned also the quality of the oversight. And this slide was shown a few days ago by Professor Pelis. Some just really mentioned that, in fact, the quality of the oversight could be affected by endometriosis. She remarked some dark central granulation 
some change in the mitochondrial content, some uh, anomalies in the spindle, and uh, the zona pellucida could be hardened. At that time, when Sanchez published that, there was no evidence and further investigation were required. And I will come back on this slide later on. Now, on the other side, do, I, do we have scientific argument in favor of surgery? I would like to make two preliminary remarks. The ovarian reserve and the quality of the oocyte. In fact, it's important to notice that the ovarian reserve is already depleted in women with endometrioma even before surgery. I guess that all of you, they know this very nice cartoon from Wallace and Kensley reporting the number of uh, growing, non-growing follicles before the birth and after the birth until the menopause. In the blue line here is the mean, the average of the follicular ovarian reserve the, in the normal range. But probably in a more or less 25, 30 percent of women with endometrioma, the ovarian reserve is significantly lower and decrease with the time, like in the normal women. So that the ovarian reserve is already depleted. Do we have scientific argument to explain that? The first paper published in Fertility and Sterility by our group was a hypothesis. And at that time, we made the hypothesis that endometrioma could be a possible cause of reduced ovarian reserve in women with endometriosis. We continue the study and the scientific evaluation of the ovarian cortex in women with endometrioma. And we made this uh, hypothesis in this publication. And in fact, in that paper, we remarked that in ovary with endometrioma, there were more atretic follicles than in the ovary without endometrioma, even in the same women. And our hypothesis is that the endometrioma is responsible for focal inflammation. It induces structural destruction of normal cortex, with as a consequence fibrosis and loss of cortex specific stroma, leading to an enhancement of recruitment with as a consequent the atresia. And it was proved in our study that significant more atretic and uh, abnormal follicles were present in the ovary with endometrioma when compared to the normal ovary. It provoked a dysregulation of the follicular genesis with as a consequence a decrease of the IMH and a decrease of the growing follicle, meaning it's the burnout effect due to the presence of endometrioma. And in fact, other paper from the team of Ivo Brosens and Stefan Gortz also demonstrate that there are, even in the very younger lady, the adolescent, progressive small muscle metaplasia and fibrosis of a cortical layer. And in that paper, the propose a minimally invasive technique to reduce the growth of the endometrioma. Also in a paper from the team of uh, Tommaso Falcone, I say that at baseline, patients with endometrioma 
have significantly lower anti-mullerian hormone. So that there are several arguments to prove that something wrong happened in the ovary containing an endometrioma. And very recently, Mudzi make an overview, a systematic review and meta-analysis. And this conclusion is ovarian reserve evaluate with AMH is reduced in women with ovarian endometrioma compare both to patients with other benign ovarian cysts and to patients with healthy ovaries. So that histology and AMH evaluation demonstrate that the ovarian reserve is depleted in women with endometrioma even before surgery, at least in a certain number of women. In a review that we made on the oxidative stress, it's possible, of course, and that was mentioned also by Professor Pelissa. Oxidative stress present in the pelvic cavity can be responsible of the pathogenesis of endometrios, and no doubt that it could have a toxic effect on the follicle. I come back to the slide of Sanchez. Is the oversight quality affected by endometrios at that time? Further investigation is required. But we know from the paper of Kobo published online in Fertility and Sterility, and the last webinar by Antonio Pelissa, they have confirmed the lower quality of the oversight in women with endometrioma. That was one of the first proof demonstrate that after freezing, after vitrification, the survival rate was much lower and significantly lower in the oversight from women with endometrioma. And even that is a slide show by my friend Somigliana in favor of IVF, in, in favor of IVF as first approach. But look, this is a slide show by Edgar. Clearly, it suggests that the endometrioma can have a toxic effect on the healthy tissue containing the follicle. And we know, and we have already published that several times, that iron, rust, and no can have a toxic effect. And there are several other factors influencing the health of the follicle. Also, quite recently, it was demonstrated by an analysis of a follicular fluid in women with endometrioma that there were a highly significant toxic microenvironment in the follicular fluid. So that there are several arguments proving that the endometrioma per se can have a toxic effect. Yes, it's true that if surgery has to be proposed in ovarian endometrioma management, which one? Looking at the Cochrane Review, published in 2005 and 2007, in fact, this uh, Cochrane review make a very bad, very bad job. They conclude that the excisional surgery for endometrioma provided for a more favorable outcome than drainage and ablation with regard to the recurrence of the endometrioma, recurrence of symptoms, 
and subsequent spontaneous pregnancy rate. And from that moment, everybody start to do cystectomy and no ablation. But only to randomize a study comparing the two approach were formed and included in this review. And a very too small series. There are major concerns because in both studies, the post op ovarian reserve was not evaluated. And we know that cystectomy for endometrioma has an effect on the ovarian reserve. There are a lot of papers, I have no time, of course, to go into details, but look, it started in 1996. And all these papers make concern on the cystectomy, on the follicular response after cystectomy. A lot of papers, some Migliana, Exostos, Muzi, Zerkine, Pados, and Donne, all of them published that cystectomy for endometrioma could have a deleterious effect. I would like you to concentrate on one of the most important papers published by Munzi. Read with me. Close to the ovarian hillus, the ovarian tissue removed along the endometrioma wall mostly consisted of tissue which contain primordial, primary, and secondary follicles in 69% of cases. It's known for a long time. And unfortunately, people continue to make aggressive ovarian cystectomy. Coming back to this slide, we may easily imagine that while the surgeon is trying to remove the pseudo capsula, the risk to remove together the healthy ovarian tissue is great. It has been proved by several papers because there is no plane of cleavage. And in fact, the fibrosis is not pathologic. We have to destroy only this small part, that is the chocolate. The endometrial epithelium and stroma thickness never exceed 100, 200 micron, so that we have just to destroy this part and the capsula can remain in place. Look, cystectomy for endometrioma. When we start the cystectomy, Plane of dissection, it's easy and it could be removed. But look, then here, for example, you see already the adhesions with uh, numerous blood vessels between the endometrioma and the ovarian cortex. And if you continue the surgery here, you see that we will provoke bleeding necessitating coagulation, we will interfere with the blood supply. And close to the helix, there is a lot of adhesions and there is a risk to continue the surgery. So that we propose to start with a cystectomy when it's easy and when the plane of dissection is given. But we know from the study by Mutzi that close to the helix, there is adhesions between the healthy tissue and the endometrioma, so that you should stop at, them at that time the excision and we have to ablate the endometrial wall when there is a risk of bleeding, of adhesions, when you continue the surgery. So that what we propose it's to start with a cystectomy, you remove more or less 80% of the endometrioma 
and then you vaporize the CO2 laser with the coagulate with the plasma jet we, here but we believe that the CO2 laser for this hole it's uh, better because the minimal thermal defect and you just apply it close to the helix and the final result is that the volume the residual volume of the ovary is quite normal can we prove that yes and it was published in fertility and sterility we compare the ovarian volume and the antral follicle count after what we call the combiner technique excision and ablation and we compare to the women with endomet without endometriosis of similar age. And you see that after the combined technique, the ovarian volume and the antral follicle count is similar to those of women without endometriosis, proving, proving that, in fact, it was purple that the combined technique is not deleterious for the ovarian reserve. But I guess that a very strong argument in favor of surgery, if the skill is there, if the equipment is there, is the cumulative pregnancy rate during the first year after surgery. And as you can see here, that after surgery for endometrioma, the pregnancy rate is more or less is more than 50 percent after one year after where there is like a plateau and uh if the patient is not pregnant she will be sent to ivf but what we propose is that surgery first to achieve a high rate of pregnancies without requiring IVF. Zonderwein, Rob uh, Bob Taylor, Paula Vigano wrote a nice review in a Nature Review Disease Center. And you see here in this cartoon that women with endometrioma, they clearly notice that they propose in that case surgery of course for minimal of mild endometriosis without endometrioma surgery is not required but it's required for endometrioma surely for endometrioma more than three centimeters so that my first uh, conclusion is that we should analyze all the different options. But ovarian endometrioma surgery could be considered as a first approach. Yes, because ovarian endometriosis is a progressive disease, an inflammatory disease, which is deleterious for the ovarian reserve. Moreover, surgery allows patients to be pregnant naturally in more than 50% of cases. That is what I can call my option. And even Garcia Velasco and Somigliana, who are in favor of IVF first, they proposed in one paper strict indication for resection of endometrioma before IVF. The rapid growth, suspicious feature noted at ultrasound, pain attributed to the mass, potential for rupture during pregnancy, inability to access follicle in normal ovarian tissue. And I have added that if there are more than three centimeters and bilateral, I will be in favor of surgery. Let me finish my lecture by two specific points. 
this very large endometrioma. This lady has only one ovary remain with a large endometrioma more than 10 centimeters, with a very thin ovarian cortex. Of course, if you do surgery, cystectomy, in that case, it will result in an ophorectomy. The final result will be like an ophorectomy with high FSH, low IMH. So that in that specific case, we will propose the two-step procedures, drainage, wide opening and rinsing. Could be done in some circumstance by ultrasound. GnRH agonist or antagonist for three months and a second look laparoscopy for internal wall vaporization. And do we have argument in case of large endometrioma for surgery? You see, there's a review published in the European Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology mentioned that when a woman has an endometrioma more than five centimeters at the time of IVF, it significantly decreases responsiveness to superovulation. So that this review is an argument in favor of surgery for the large cyst. Coming to another question, frequent question, what about the recurrence of endometrioma? Which strategy? In that case, my opinion is very clear. No surgery. And there are other papers in the literature demonstrating, reporting that surgical intervention for the sole purpose of improving higher care outcome does not seem justified in women with recurrent endometrioma. And I fully agree with that concept. In fact, in case of recurrence of endometrioma after surgery, the risk to have a real, by a second surgery, to have a deleterious effect on the ovarian reserve is significantly much higher. Coming to the conclusion, the scenario is multifaceted and patients are very frequently overwhelmed by the burden of contrasting information. Physicians may be tempted to guide the decision based on their own value and competence, which should be viewed as a mistake. In general, there is a growing agreement that major attention should be given for freedom to choose. And try IVF surgery first should not be a physician decision, but in most cases, it will be the decision of a properly informed patient. And this is my final slide. I propose that all gynecologists involved in a reproduction facing to a woman with endometrioma explain clearly the risk of surgery and the risk of IVF. And after explain, having explained carefully this cartoon to take the right decision with the agreement of the patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jacques, for an excellent presentation. While you present the topic, there were quite a lot of questions coming in. But if I want to summarize them into one or two questions, um, what's about fertility preservation for all patients before going any treatment or any kind of treatment for endometrioma? Is it related to age? Is it related to AMH? Is it related to whether the endometrioma is on one side of the ovary or on two ovaries? So maybe, maybe you can address just in a few sentences, uh, how do you see 
uh, fertility preservation in these cases? I guess that uh, I didn't mention fertility preservation because uh, Antonio Pelissa did that uh, very, very well. And uh, I fully agree with you. I didn't present also fertility preservation that because there were already a lot of information about my uh, in my lecture. But I will say that what you say is exactly true. If a woman is more than 35, has a low ovarian reserve, have bilateral endometrioma, we should proceed to fertility preservation because there's a woman at high risk to be to have a very rapidly a very loud ovarian reserve with a poor result in IVF outcome. And we have seen in the presentation of uh, uh, Antonio Pelliser from the last publication from uh, Kobo that there is a huge difference in the result in terms of live birth in women less than 35 years when compared to women more than 35 years. That was known in the egg donation program and now very recently it has been proved also in women with endometrioma. So that I guess that we have to keep in mind that in women with endometrioma, we have to suggest these women to have their baby as soon as possible. And if they have a low image, more than 35 years of bilateral endometrioma, to proceed, to ask the gynecologist to proceed to fertility preservation. And of course, oversight is a good option. Oversight vitrification is a good option. But don't forget the ovarian tissue preservation. And we have a start already a long term, long time ago to cryopreserve ovarian tissue in a woman with ovarian endometrioma. We can do it during the surgery. And with a woman with a risk of recurrence, of course, before she had a recurrence at the time of surgery, the first step of surgery, please try to remove at least a part of the LT ovary tissue and proceed to slow freezing. That's the different options, of course, should be discussed with the patient. Thank you very much again, Jacques. And I just would like to remind the audience that your email address will be posted for the next 48 hours. If anybody has a question, he can approach you directly and I'm sure that you will be happy to answer him. So thank you, thank you, Jacques, thank you, everybody, and good day. Hello, everybody.